Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, very excited for our August 2021 uh, iCoder and online mediators call. Um, delighted to be here with you and very much delighted to have Laura Kelly here to share with us the latest on immediation. The, the, the first time I saw immediation, I think it was at a conference in Melbourne, and, uh, and Laura did a presentation and I was blown away with the professionalism and the, the business plan, the expertise of the team, the power of the tool. And I have to say, it's just gotten better and better uh, since. And I think it's, it is definitely one of the most powerful online dispute resolution platforms anywhere in the world. And I've, I've been wanting to get them to present the iCoder for a long time. I have to give props to Graham because uh, I think Graham was the one who uh, actually scheduled uh, you to present, Laura. But I'm delighted that we're all here together and that we can share the latest and greatest about your platform with the iCoder membership. So why don't we dive in so, so you can share the substance and, and we'll have as much time as possible for Q&A at the end. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Colin, and great to meet you all. Uh, I thought that given the, um, you know, the, the caliber of this group, I might talk a little bit about, you know, the business of what I'm doing as, and the background, as well as um, showing you snippets of the team and the platform through video. Um, I do have the platform available if anyone wants to ask any specific questions by way of demo, but I thought it might just be more interesting for you to, to sort of see the, the holistic approach that we're trying to take and, um, Please feel free to ask any questions as we go, because it's much more fun that way. So uh, as you may know, I'm a barrister based in Melbourne. So for those of you who are um, not familiar with the system that we have, it's exactly the same as the UK system, a split system of attorneys. So solicitors and barristers. And I started my life as a solicitor uh, doing corporate law. Uh, I was based in um, London at Slaughter and May for a while and then eventually came back to Australia and decided that the, the law firm life in Australia wasn't quite, um, quite as exciting having been at uh, one of the preeminent firms in London. So I decided to pick up the practices of an advocate, um, which was a long held sort of dream back from watching LA Law <laughs> as a child. And so I, I did that seven years ago and started litigating and I think just because of my background was commercial and not litigation, I was quite shocked to see some of the disparity that existed um, once you got below the top tier of litigation into where a lot of people and businesses are and really felt compelled to try to do something about it. And I'd heard about Colin's um, uh, ex you know, experience with eBay uh, and Modria and thought really something could be done in my space, which was commercial. So I started the business to try to um, really help people by having uh, senior members of the profession helicoptered into a piece of technology to help people resolve disputes really effectively. What's now happened is we've decided that that platform could be deployed much more broadly um, than just our own services business. And so we've started to make it available by subscription. And what we're trying to do is actually really emulate the environment that lawyers and courts and mediators are familiar with physically and to try to bring that online so that when they come online, the experience that they have is frictionless and it feels like a digital legal environment as opposed to a physical legal environment. And so that's really what we're trying to do uh, to leverage our expertise. Um, just a little bit there about um, about the access to justice piece, which was really originally the driver, as I said, um, the fees that were being spent by my clients were prohibiting them from settling. And so the original platform was really designed to speed up that settlement process and try to say, let's have it much, much earlier in a legal process, either parallel to or um, at the same time as a court proceeding or try to avoid court proceedings. And we're all familiar with the access to justice message. But I guess the one thing I wanted to point out as we go along is that it's becoming broader than that because the sustainability piece of online dispute resolution is really emerging. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, if not part of the campaign for greener arbitrations. And so we're starting to say, look, this is not, no longer just about accessibility. It's actually about sustainability as well. The interesting thing about the times we're living in right now is it's been an accelerant for these kind of businesses. And um, we like to use this slide to sort of 
to show the power um, of COVID and what it's done, which we think is quite positive for our industry. Um, but for lawyers, what we, what we know they experience is this sort of speed dial that they got to the future that they didn't even know was coming. I think we all knew that it was coming and we could see um, where the profession needed to go. But for them, it's felt like a damn wall breaking because not only did they have to get to grips with the technology that we're quite familiar with so quickly, but also the number of cases and the volume of cases is extreme now because of COVID. And so we like to sort of say to them, we will be your guide through this. We understand that you're drowning, but we think we can help you by emulating the physical environment. Um, but as we all know, I think it's worth reminding ourselves, we're at an inflection point here where they've all been forced, the courts and the lawyers to adopt, I think the estimate is five to 10 years worth of technology over the past six months. So we really like to think that we're at an inflection point in this industry and to try to take advantage of that to achieve the mission that we've all had for some time, and particularly Colin and those of you who are veterans of ODR, to really try to capture this moment to say, how can we bed down all of that work that's been done and really try to get the adoption of this technology um, on a broad scale? And we believe the way to do that is to be making sure that the environment that these lawyers and courts are going into is seamless for them compared to their physical environment. So we're, as I said, trying to um, not so much pioneer um, online dispute resolution because we think that that's already been done, but what we're trying to do is, is help lead the charge of that digital transformation, both inside courts and inside, um, and inside law firms as well. I thought I might share the voices of my team just so that um, you can see, I guess, the passion and the breadth and depth of the engineers and the lawyers working on this um, in Australia and New Zealand. Hopefully this works, Colin. The mediation provides both technology and a service to try to enable uh, companies and people to resolve disputes effectively and efficiently. I started a mediation because I could see that a lot of people in our system were locked out of being able to access justice effectively. There has been a real desire to ensure that there is a speedy resolution of disputes through the addition of services like online dispute resolution options. I think when you talk about generic video conferencing, you're talking about just a mode of communication, which is completely fine. Video conferencing really these days is predominantly talking heads. When you want to facilitate a complex matter, a mediation, an arbitration, a court proceeding which has formality, process, structure, documents, how do we make life easier for someone that's maybe in distress or has a disability? Zoom and Teams and Google Meets are, are fine, but you need far more than that. You need meeting rooms where mediators can caucus, the ability to draft an agreement online with everyone present, uh, to sign in an authentic and binding way, brainstorm in a digital environment. It's world-class technology which we've built to enable video collaboration, but also streamline processes and systems for both the court and legal market. The entire platform comes together in a solution that speaks to the legal market and dispute resolution market in a way that they understand. Digital collaboration, whiteboarding, document co-drafting, live streaming, all of this is finesse that you just don't get on a standard video conference. And then when you combine that with our ability to streamline workflows, do data intake, manipulate documents, and give courts and lawyers everything they need in one place, I think it starts to blow your mind. What we do at a mediation is more about creating a digital legal environment. All those things that you need to replicate in a physical environment so that then that whole justice continuum process can keep working. Our co-drafting tools, um, straight through to our whiteboard tools, the integrations that are possible with your case management system. Dispute resolution can't just take old habits and put them online. What we need to do is push into a new frontier of, of moving to help people access the system better and resolve things more quickly. I've worked on countless technology projects and I've never seen features delivered into a product as fast as they are within a mediation. You will never hear the term Zoom bombing, you know, when it comes to a mediation. 
Where our mediation has made huge advancements, I think, is in the, the safety and security of the platform, but also a bespoke service to provide different experiences for the user. The mediation platform is helping all of the diverse participants in a matter work together, whether it's the applicant and respondent establishing the context, and even support people that help with things like accessibility needs. It really thinks about all the parties that are involved in a dispute or a complaint. It really adeptly replicates and is sensitive to the dynamics of a dispute or a complaint or a litigation in action. Human mediation is pretty incredible. So you've got people who are at the top of their game and I think it's not only just in the legal space but also in the engineering space from NASA, Google, all these incredible places and then you combine that with people who really know their stuff legally. Um, everything from hardcore technologists through to hardcore lawyers, bringing all the pieces of the puzzle together to build something that's really unique and valuable that solves really deep, complex problems. I think we have an incredible blend of both legal, dispute resolution, technical and triaging services, which in my experience is second to none. We've got now a panel of over 100 superstars from Australia and New Zealand who we use regularly to resolve disputes for people in a way that is groundbreaking. We have the leading experts in dispute resolution from a whole range of backgrounds, there wouldn't be much that these people haven't dealt with. We do whatever it takes for our clients. This is a mantra that I've had from day one with everything from the building of the platform through to the deployment and making sure that every case is done well. So what that means is you will have someone who is a lawyer sitting in your matter with you making sure that the platform is deployed into the court or the legal environment in a way that makes sense and can be adjusted for the circumstances. On any given day, the case that that one person has, that's their day in court. And so while it may be one of many for us, it's critical to them. And I think that ethos has sort of permeated the organisation. It's really brought home to people the advantage of doing business in a digital way. You know, it's just so much more efficient. And of course, when people are in multiple jurisdictions or even cities, digital makes a whole lot of sense. I really think that once people start working in this way and see the efficiency, that this really becomes the norm. Move Over CLM, a mediation is the pioneer of DLM, Dispute Lifecycle Management. A mediation is the best solution for any type of dispute resolution. A media oh, not again. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> hopefully that gave, gave you a sense of the team members that I've got, which are all around the world now, and they're really, really exciting um, technologists and lawyers, and, and I'm delighted to have them helping me try to build this thing. So what we have really is, um, as mentioned in the video, technology plus a service. The service is being used more to deploy into large government projects. So rather than really, it doesn't really compete so much with the one-off mediation or arbitration market. It's more when a government requires a panel um, for a particular project that we normally curate that panel together with the technology and try to, to put it into a government agency to help the consumers um, that are being funded by the government. But the technology, and I'll show you a demo video in a moment, the technology is built around the original mediation platform digital collaboration tool. But we also have a whole lot of other things that sit around it. So we're able to build workflows for arbitration and mediation centres, um, do things for courts that I guess aren't normally done on a standard video conference. And we've started to move into the building of complaints, um, complaints and dispute lifecycle management systems as well. So all the things that consumers lawyers and businesses need to actually get through the early stages of a matter to end up in the mediation or arbitration on the, um, the digital collaboration platform. All of that is part of the, the offering as well. I just thought I'd give you a sense of um, how we've gone about trying to get traction. And I think it's probably important for those of us in this industry to understand um, that if it's going to be successful at a large scale, it needs to be commercial because I mean, I'm sure as Colin has experienced, you can't really do very much that's innovative without funding. 
And so we've managed to raise quite a bit of money from some large, um, very well-known investors based in Australia. And what that's enabled us to do is to try to bed down our revenue at an enterprise level, which is then actually enabling us to do the stuff at the other end of the spectrum, the consumer end and the, um, the subscription end, because without that, we just wouldn't have been able to stay alive long enough um, to actually build a global product. So we started um, after launch in September of 2019 with getting some very large courts and tribunals onto the platform, including Australia's Commonwealth Courts, uh, which led, I guess, through a flywheel effect to others in the legal market being aware of what we were doing because they were coming into those matters inside the court and then asking us whether they could use the platform outside of it. Um, when we merged with Mike Heron in New Zealand, that led to some fairly large scale projects in New Zealand because the government there is very progressive um, and they're pioneering this um, style of uh, private dispute resolution authorised by government where they're asking us to run projects at a large scale. Um, and so one of the most exciting examples of that at the moment is we are running a claim system for sport. So anyone in sport from Olympians all the way down to uh, people at a club level, if they have a dispute or issue relating to sport, it can be employment. Um, there's been a lot of um, uh, harassment and bullying and those kind of things. They can come to us and then we will put them onto um, a mediation pathway using the platform. So that's really been an exciting development, I think, um, across the ditch, as we say, in New Zealand. And then finally, the, the last piece of the puzzle for us has been a Microsoft um, agreement where they came to us and said, look, we, we understand that Teams is not going to deliver what it could potentially do um, inside the court system with an online dispute resolution platform. So we've now um, done an integration, which will be released shortly with Microsoft Teams so that users can um, actually just access the platform from within Teams. So we're hoping that that will really help us push out into the global market. Um, and again, help us to stay really sustainable from a revenue base. I've mentioned already, I think the, the importance, not only of access to justice now, but the sustainability message that we're trying to, um, to get behind, as well as obviously conflict reduction. Um, but finally, <laughs> Let me just show you a bit of a, um, a bit more of a deeper dive into the platform and please feel free again at the end of this to ask me about any specific features that you've seen that you'd like more information on. Dispute resolution and court proceedings are complicated. There's formality, process, structure, documents and multiple parties involved. Conducting these matters with a standard video conferencing tool can be problematic. Thankfully, there's a mediation, a purpose-built application that could be configured as a digital courtroom, a dispute resolution ecosystem, or for one-off matters. The award-winning platform has been designed from the ground up by renowned barrister and entrepreneur, Laura Keeley. So for those in the legal market, everything just makes sense. From the moment you log in, you will see that existing matters are neatly organized with real-time status updates. Creating a new matter quickly provides the user with the sense that the platform extends far beyond generic video conferencing. With essential case types pre-configured, participants are divided into relevant parties, each with their correct role or label on display. Your level of control, and that of the participant, is customizable. For instance, you can prevent applicants and respondents from messaging each other. Prior to the matter, you can determine which parties can view attachments or evidence. Your private office or household items can be blurred out or hidden with background filters. As you would expect, premium conferencing features are included as standard with the ability to change the look and feel of the interface, enhanced audio and video feeds, screen sharing, and a range of participant video tile arrangements. When configured for hearings, the platform mimics real-life court proceedings with the ability to present individual matters on a publicly viewable live stream. Advanced private rooms are also available where you can speak separately with applicants, respondents or third parties in up to nine private rooms. 
In an instant, you can mute all participants, a team, or a group of individuals. Whilst in conference, a mediation provides the ability to co-draft documents such as terms and heads of agreement in a way that emulates real proceedings using pass the pen functionality with authentic and binding e-signatures. In fact, you can co-draft and sign literally any document using a mediation's state-of-the-art custom docs feature. If a document or matter involves more than words, you can use a mediation's built-in whiteboard that intuitively records each notation and also provides a simple and efficient download capability. All non-scribing participants can view the whiteboard updates in real time. When you are finished with the whiteboard, you can upload the content, mark it as important, and set the required access level. There are times where you need to make less formal comments without interrupting. Here, you can chat with everyone involved or a specific participant. And remember, many features like this are configurable within a mediation, so you can enable or restrict communications if and when required. As you can see, the whole platform comes together in a way that is groundbreaking. And we haven't even mentioned our enhanced security features, dial-in connections, quick conference functionality, live translation, or the data intake and analytics available. A mediation's legal innovation and customer success teams are on hand to ensure your success every step of the way. From the initial configuration to onboarding and in-matter support, you can rest assured that any queries sent to the support team are answered by a professional with a legal background. Our team is bolstered by a panel of more than 100 international experts from the legal and dispute resolution market. They're fully integrated and available to assist any individual or organization upon request. Visit the platform and get started today. So there we have it. My computer's CPU must be going mental because it's actually started whirring. <laughs> so I might stop sharing. <laughs> so I might stop screen sharing, Colin. No, no worries, no worries. Thank you so much, Laura. I mean, uh, one of the things, there's so much uh, that I wanna to touch on in the wake of those presentations, but I wanna compliment you on the professionalism and polish of your materials. Everything from your logo to your corporate communications, to your website, to those videos, it really, I think it takes uh, the presentation of ODR to the next level. And uh, I wanna compliment you on that because I know that's hard to do. Uh, so, you. so that's, it was really that great. Thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing those videos. Um, but I, I do want to open it up and, and, uh, sort of spark a wider conversation. I see in the chat that Lucia posted, um, your panel is from Australia and New Zealand. Is that where your target market is? And is it where your cases and users originate? If so, or if not, do you seek and or service a larger international customer and mediators? Thanks so much for the question. Um, obviously, it's where we started. So I, I managed to get the profession or a number of senior members of the profession to really see the sense of this um, four years ago and then merge with Mike Heron's company, whom you might be familiar with, which was Definitely. called Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and Colin, I'm pretty sure you came down to Auckland for that um, ODR forum. I did, that Ian hosted. hosted. Yeah, and he, he yeah. hosted a reception for us as well. He did. Uh, so yeah, so that's great that the two of you have joined forces. That, 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 that's actually news yeah. to me and it's exciting. Yeah, so we did that last year because we, we just kept talking about the fact that we were doing the same thing. And, you know, he's got an even um, more demanding practice than I have. And I think could see that the technology that we'd built was pretty powerful. So we, we merged last year. And so we are currently operating in Australia and New Zealand predominantly. However, um, with the advent of the Microsoft um, uh, deal and also just the inquiries that are coming through we're really keen on building out into other markets um, and think that although it's quite difficult to do that from a business perspective at the same time as bedding down the Antipodean market it's probably really important to try to get the technology into the hands of others so we are contemplating um, expanding the panel to a global panel um, so if anyone's interested in joining please please shoot me a text or a, um, an email because it, it, I think it is, it would be really exciting to be able to have a global panel that could be deployed all over the world um, that was plugged in to really help accessibility. I think in maybe some of the areas that are not so traditionally serviced, mm -hmm. we have a lot of inquiries from, you know, people in the Pacific and, you know, all the islands and things where they just don't have the robust justice systems that we have. And so Absolutely. to have that global 
panel in different time zones, I think would be hugely powerful. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, one of the things that's always been interesting to me uh, in terms of the Australian market is your easy accessibility to Asia. And there's so much that's happening in that market. I know it's been a priority for Australia to tap some of those markets. Have you had any conversations about, uh, are you handling cases in Singapore, China, <clears throat> Japan? Is that is that a focus area? It hasn't been lately, mainly because um, the, some of the, the <clears throat> Asian mediation and arbitration centers are quite forward thinking. And I think they're, they're running off and doing their own tech. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the early days, we did have quite a few conversations, but most of the inquiries we're, come, we're getting now are centered around the United States and mm -hmm. Europe and the UK. Yeah, so much happening in the US. So I mean, mm. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there, but I, I want to loop back and, and I want to uh, revisit this in terms of international expansion. But can you tell, because I think uh, the folks on the call might not know as much about the current state of the Australian market. Uh, and I know you had a slide there where you talked about VCAT and sort of the administrative tribunals and how that all works in Australia. Can you just give an overview of uh, sort of the state of online dispute resolution in Australia and uh, some, some of the areas of most promising traction that in mediations mm. had? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it is interesting how the large multinational companies rushed into the space quite quickly, uh, particularly inside the court system. So it's very fragmented at the moment. Um, You've got a lot of courts using a combination of Zoom teams and, um, well, it's predominantly Zoom and teams and, mm -hmm. and us um, when we get used. Uh, we, we tend to pick up more of the mediation. So uh, where people require a platform that's built for mediation, because that's actually far harder, as we all know, to mm -hmm. do online and a point and shoot hearing. So that's inside the court system. And we are getting um, traction from some of the state courts who are looking for something a little more complex now that they've got past the first shock of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and I brought on Rebecca Ross, who appeared on that video, who was actually one of the chief registrars of the court in Northern Territory. And um, it's quite unusual, I guess, to get someone out of the court system to work in private business, but she could see, I think, that it was really important from an access perspective. So she's running projects, um, really exciting projects in the Northern Territory with vulnerable Indigenous witnesses and things who wow. really just don't get any, don't get anything. So she's driving out to these remote communities where they host court and giving them the ability to participate for the first time. So there's a lot going on in that sort of way. In terms of um, online dispute resolution, I guess, is a, was originally envisaged to keep things outside of court. I think that's still a little embryonic. The the mediation market is still pretty strong, but it's largely um, being run by some sort of quasi-governmental, you know, small business commissions and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we've started to really, well, we've started to, but we haven't yet reached out um, the peak of being able to provide holistic systems, particularly in Australia, into mm -hmm. that um, yet. But I think it's on the way. New Zealand definitely further advanced than Australia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, I think it's very interesting. I also think it does make sense to target other English language geographies first, because mm -hmm. that there's a lot of, as you said, there's commonality in the legal systems and all your materials resonate. So I think uh, the US, New Zealand, Australia, US, Canada, UK, mm -hmm. those are all great target markets. You know, I wanted to ask you a question about, and I, I, I urge other people to pipe up in the chat or raise your hand uh, if you have a question you'd like to share. But I know um, uh, you supported the, the online version of the Vismoot, uh, which is obviously the international arbitration competition. They had never done that online before. And that must have been a huge undertaking. And I was just wondering mm -hmm. maybe if you could, you know, give a couple minutes on, you know, what, what that was like and, you know, how you scaled up and supported people from all over the world on the platform. That's an amazing stress test. That was, that was the first commercial contract that we had. And other than one off or, you know, a few, um, a few sort of early mediations that we'd done um, for business after we launched in 2019. And so we were really starting to look at which industries would um, suit uh, aggregated demand um, of the platform at the start of 2020. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened. And um, yeah, I, we, we knew the, the VizMoot Viz organisers, um, particularly the ones in uh, the pre-moot, 
that was hosted um, over in Asia. And so they, they asked us if we would, or I think we actually we offered, we said, we'll do the pre-moot for you. Mm. And that was very successful and it had, no competition had ever been done online before. And that was done on about a week's notice. Wow. Um, so we, we did that by, uh, at that point, setting up all of the rooms for the participants um, and then enabling, you know, giving all of those logins to the various teams and mm -hmm. actually uh, managing that process ourselves so that it was seamless. Um, we then, yeah, we then got on to um, Chris Key and uh, the, um, the Vienna Moot team and I knew them because I was at university with Chris and um, obviously I was a Viz Moot team member, I think in showing my age now, I think it was about 96. <laughs> So mm. I knew a lot about the competition. Um, and so I think we were fairly rapidly able to say, well, we think we can do this. It was horrendous because we had <clears throat> um, 2,000 people come on uh, for the first time in, inside this extremely tight framework. The, the Vismood is run ordinarily in Vienna in two-hour time slots over five days. And some of mm. you may have been to it. And they wanted to stick to that timetable on Viennese time. So um, we spun up a team of 30 customer success specialists, we now call them, but they were they're really lawyers and law students from around the world. Uh, and through La Trobe University, we got some people um, in Europe as well who were doctoral candidates and students who were very tech savvy and we trained them on how to use the platform so we had a sort of schedule of, you know, these 30 people, um, one in every matter mm -hmm. over the five days. Uh, and then, yeah, we, people, people came in for the first time. It was really, you know, it's giving me um, PTSD. I was about to say, <laughs> flashbacks, right? It was, it was, it was very stressful because, <clears throat> because they wanted to do it on V&E's time mm. and in these time, time blocks. Um, but anyway, we survived it and I think 98% of the matters completed um, and, you know, we learned a lot about the platform at scale that we just hadn't learned because we'd never used, we'd never run, you know, 500 cases simultaneously before. Totally, yeah. Yeah, so the engineers, you know, were on standby and I guess the, the benefit of having done it was that we, you know, it's very hard to get um, ordinarily, you would never get, 2000 people from all in 30 countries in an instant trying to log on. Mm -hmm. um, so that gave them a lot of indication, I guess, about what it would be like at scale in, in commercial instances once we started getting up and running. So it was a very valuable experience. And hopefully absolutely. Had, you know, well, I think that I think the Nietzsche uh, phrase works in software development, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. And to tackle something like that and pull it off, I'm sure you learned an enormous amount. Uh, that otherwise would have taken years to figure <laughs> out. I also think it probably gave you incredible exposure because a lot of the people that are involved with the Vismood are the top arbitrators in the world. So uh, I think mm. that was a, that was a genius thing. So kudos to you for pulling it off. I know. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, a high risk, high reward. Um, so another thing that you mentioned in your slide that I really like, you know, uh, Richard Susskind in his book about uh, online courts and the future of justice. He talks about how 50% of people in the world don't have access to, mm. uh, to justice. And uh, when you, and we, there's a lot of talk in the United States about access to justice and aid to J, and there's a lot of initiatives, academic and private, and also coming through the nonprofit sector, trying to expand access to justice. But I think one of the things that you talked about that I like a lot is sustainability. And what I see is a lot of these projects are funded by grants from, at least in the United States, there's an organization called the Legal Services Corporation. And they provide a grant and then someone goes off and does an innovative project, but they're not thinking about how's this going to last? You know, how are we going to build this and make it better over time? Um, so these projects are launched, they run for two years and then they shut them down. And it's like, why did, you know, we, you can learn a little bit. I mean, people write up their results, but I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your vision of sustainability within mediation, you know, in terms of not only how to launch these things, but how to make them continue and get better and stronger over time. I, I think that's something we need to think about more in ODR. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, there are two strands, I guess, to sustainability, which I've mentioned. One is environmental, and but the other is, as you say, the sustainability of, of the, the idea and the vision. 
-hmm. and the company because obviously I firmly believe that the the way to do this is actually to build a a sustainable, um, functional, revenue-generating business Mm -hmm. and thereby be able to expand the mission. So what that means is that it needs to be, it needs to have all the hallmarks of a proper operational business, which we were really able to bed down, I guess, in um, over the course of 2020 and 2021. Um, but I, I think what that means is um, you have to make sure that, you know, you know where the, where the revenue is coming from, that you're able to get it, that the, that the engineering team is able to deliver uh, in an environment where it is high stakes, Mm-hmm. And so, you know, some of these cases, well, it's always, as I said in the video, that person's day in court or that person's mediation. That's right. But, you know, as you go forward, you know, we're dealing with many of the arbitrators on this call would have dealt with billion dollar cases. And so, and the law firms involved are extremely experienced and knowledgeable. So you sort of can't fudge it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so that, you know, you have to have, engineering that's robust and stands up to um, stands up to security and uh, and just the the features and capabilities that are able to scale so we spent a lot of time last year on um, scalability of the platform resilience all these boring things that happen in the background um, the the ability to you know have what they call infrastructure as code which means that it can move different jurisdictions and you can have the platform sort of spun up in in the states or whatever in a way that complies with the relevant privacy laws and security laws for that jurisdiction. So there's a lot of um, that that sort of engineering that happens underneath mm-hmm. the, the nice part that everybody sees. That's really important, and I had no idea about. So, I, you know, I, I'd given, I guess, um, most of my attention to what everybody sees and try to get that looking good and nice. Mm-hmm. But last year really learned a lot about how to how to make it robust. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and that's an excellent point. I do think that the underlying technology, the sophistication of it, is often lost on the end user. Um, I remember in a prior conversation with your team, they were talking about getting the broadcast to YouTube working. And you know, from the end user's perspective, you click it and it works. You're like, okay, great. That's pretty simple. It's like it's not simple. It's very complicated to get that working on the back end. Uh, and as you say, you know, there's a lot of talk on the arbitration side about arbitration awards being disqualified on the basis of technology. If the technology is not secure or if the arbitrators aren't um, abiding by best practices and the use of technology, it may be that if the part- participants get an outcome that they don't agree with, they will challenge the award on the nature of the platform. And that's one of the reasons why, I mean, your expertise as a commercial lawyer is so valuable here because you know, as you say, you can't fudge it. You know, you need to meet the expectations of the participants. And if you don't, if you don't, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's, you know, you may threaten, you know, the whole process getting kind of, you know, thrown in the garbage. So I haven't heard um, about that from the arbitral award perspective. I mean, um, it would be interesting to see whether or not they could update the New York Convention to, to make sure that any requirements right. um, for, for arbitral awards. I mean, I know that, it, you know, it's it's pretty basic at the moment. It just says it's got to be signed in writing and, you know, it's got to deal with all of the issues in dispute, but right. maybe they need to deal with that because it's, it is important um, that we make sure that, it, that those awards stand up. But I would underscore what you just said. I think that technology, the polish and sophistication of the mediation platform to me is head and shoulders over many of the other uh, video ODR platforms. Uh, and especially when I saw the demo of the uh, sort of agreement, interme- intermediated agreement building process, this is something that I want to emphasize. And I'm, I want to ask you a, a question in a second about your Microsoft partnership, because I, I think that's fascinating. But, um, you know, and you emphasize this really well in the videos. People say, well, we'll just use Zoom. Well, we'll just use WebEx. Well, we'll just use Teams. Um, and I, I noticed I just had an update this morning from Zoom. And now they have these Zoom apps. You know, I think they're trying to integrate more um, intelligence and functionality into the video platform because generic video doesn't deliver a lot of the functionality oh, that parties need. And exactly as you say, you know, we can talk about this over the next 10 years, but if there's a case for that party, that case is, it's a one-shot deal and it needs to work really smoothly and completely in an integrated fashion for them. And I think that you've done a really great job. Your team's done an amazing job integrating that kind of um, you know, step-by-step negotiation document building flow 
with video. And I, and I don't think you can do that through any of the existing. It is a scary thing to compete against Microsoft and Zoom, you know, because these are well-funded billion dollar platforms, um, but they're not gonna ever put the time and energy into building the sophistication that I think a mediation has for that, that, um, that sort of structured negotiation resolution tool. I mean, I think, thanks, Colin. I, I th it, it is interesting to see though, I mean, I think the rising tide, tide lifts all boats and the fact that um, people are rushing into this sector and seeing the opportunity there just goes to show how underdone it was mm -hmm. and how little technological adoption there had been. So I'm grateful at least to those large multinationals for sort of helping helping us get to the point of, um, of being, you know, alive and functional. Uh, but I think, you know, they're always going to stop at a point where we really start, which is all of the little things that advocates need and all of the little things that lawyers need and the participants need. Absolutely. You know, so for example, we've got witness control so that your witnesses can't see the documents. We, we just nominate them as a witness. Mm -hmm. to protect their testimony. Um, I don't think that any of these multinational videos are ever going to get to that level of adaptation because they can't do that for, for every sector. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, I think, what teams are saying to us is, you know, for, for a lot of use cases inside a court, teams is great. But when you get to the really, the finesse of, of exactly what advocates, barristers need and exactly what the judge requires, in some cases in particular, you need something that's a lot more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and so the generic video conference market is going to grow, but in all of our industries, legal and non-legal, I guess there will be specialist um, offerings that absolutely arrive. Uh, yeah. Marisa mentioned the New York convention will be impossible to change, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, Marais also has her hand up. So Marais, do you want to elaborate further on that? Yeah, hi, Laura. Um, yes, at that time, you know, years ago when we met in Geneva, Colin, you may have remembered one of the meetings I asked Soriel, um, actually I suggested that for the electronic awards, if we had to start um, uh, notifying awards electronically, whether the New York Convention could potentially be adapted. And he said, forget about it, because if you, if you will never succeed to get 160 countries signed the New York Convention again, right. and it would be easier to modify the um, uh, arbitration laws. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is one of the comments I, I wanted to make. But the second one is about uh, the comment you, you made call in regarding potentially suing arbitrators if, some, if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. I know that this has been um, an item or rather an issue currently being discussed, but I fail to understand why if artificial intelligence is used to draft the award, potentially there may be a risk, but otherwise if the platform is used for all the logistical aspects of the procedure for exchanging documents, uploading documents for the hearings or whatever, provided that the arbitrators and the parties agree on the way to use the technology or the platform, I fail to understand why the arbitrators may be sued if something goes wrong, but we need also to define what that thing may be. Sure, So that's sure. the comment that I wanted to make. Yeah, and, and Mehrez, you know more about this than anybody. So uh, I bow to your expertise on this issue. This was a conversation within the Arbtrek, Arbtech and CyberArb Slack. There was a discussion about, um, uh, arbitrators that may not abide by best practices in information security. And it may be that, um, that parties argue later that they were reluctant to share information they felt was important in the process because they didn't know it was going to be, if it was going to be protected. You know, I, I, we, we do, I know uh, when I talk about ethics in ODR, you know, when you use an open platform like Zoom, if I'm creating breakout rooms, and I understand that that's not a good arbitration example because everything's in joint session and arbitration. But if I add the wrong person to the wrong breakout room, or I, you know, I tell someone that, that they're muted or they're not recorded and they are being recorded, you know, I, I'm saying that there could be some procedural issues that theoretically could be used to, to impeach uh, an outcome in an arbitration. I don't know of any case that that's actually happened yet. But my, what I'm saying is a platform like a mediation is great because it's purpose built for these processes. So you're kind of locked into a tool that's going to be taking care of, uh, of some of these, you know, who has access to what 
and providing that transparency, the tool is built with the ethical obligations of arbitrators and mediators in mind. And that's mm -hmm. not the case for Teams and that's not the case for Zoom. And it may give you too much power. And then uh, that, that power can be uh, accidentally used. I mean, uh, this is one of the scenarios we talk about in an ethical scenario where you reveal a fact that was communicated in confidence and it completely undermines the process. And it's because maybe it was a technological error. You posted something in one discussion and you intended to post it someplace else. So I, I do think there's a very strong argument as Laura says, for the field building our own technology and managing that technology. So we can, <laughs> we can say, these are the kinds of things that we have in our iCoder standards or whatever standards from whatever an arbitral institution around what information is shared, you know, how long the process takes, what disclosures are made. And that's certainly not built into the generic platforms and probably never will be because they're used for so many different types of applications. Touching on another point you made about iCoder, and I wonder whether what we need to do is, I mean, we want to set the practical standard of what it is, but whether there, there should be a sort of formal standard that maybe the profession, like a group that this sets and says, well, they, these are the core requirements that we say mm. for, um, for arbitration and mediation, you know, you need to meet these requirements and some sort of certification because, I mean, there's a lot of things popping up, which is fine. I mean, they asked me how to do it and, you know, we, we share what we can without mm -hmm. um, in the interest of our own shareholders, but, I think a lot of a lot of baby companies are rushing into this space thinking that they know what to do, and it, it could be potentially sort of dangerous to the overall um, perception of online dispute resolution. I absolutely agree with that. You know what what I saw. I mean, we've seen we've had multiple waves of ODR innovation, but with each wave, when the opportunity is identified, you see non ODR non dispute resolution experts come in because they want to uh, you know sort of put their foot in the door and. Uh, and they don't know the ethical standards. They don't know. So they start calling their platform. I think one company in particular that did not advertise itself as ODR at all. They never, and they don't have any dispute resolution experts involved with their organization, but then they started to see ODR was getting some traction and they just said, oh, now we're ODR. And, mm -hmm. you know, we don't really have a way to say, well, this is ODR and this isn't ODR. And then, no. you know, because we, we're not really a professional association in the same way where we certify platforms and say, well, no, you can't use this name ODR because you haven't been certified. But I do think that that's an appropriate role for iCoder. And obviously we have a lot of iCoder members on the call here. Maybe we would say, look, an ODR platform needs to have this kind of functionality. You know, mm -hmm. and when people say, oh, I use Zoom for ODR. It's like, well, okay, but an ODR platform needs to have this functionality and Zoom does not have that functionality. You know, we could make that distinction. Um, we need to do what yeah. champagne does, which <laughs> yeah. to say, this is champagne, although we can't obviously link it to a, a region like that. But I, I think you, this group could certainly say, these are the things that we would recommend. And we say, this platform has it and has been put through a right. testing process because loads of institutions do that for other things. Absolutely. And I think, again, iCoder, a lot of our certifications are voluntary. Like these are the components that need to be in an ODR platform. And here's a list of platforms that we know that meet these requirements. You know, I think that would be valuable. It's funny what you say about Champagne, you know, because they said nothing not from Champagne. Champagne is a place. You cannot call anything that is not from Champagne, Champagne. And then I think they put a huge shot in the arm of the Prosecco market and people realize that they like Prosecco better than Champagne. And now they're like, oh no, what have we done? Uh, you know, so uh, we don't want to do that. But, um, but I, I think, you know, Laura, you make an excellent point. And if we're building our own tools, well, then let's, let's make sure that we say, look, these tools have been built with our ethical standards in mind. And, and this is why you should think very seriously about utilizing a tool that has this functionality because we, we've identified as iCoder, these are functionalities that matter. And mm -hmm. other platforms that don't have them, it may put your parties at a disadvantage. So I, I, I think that's something we need to think about more at iCoder. So I'll take that back to the board. Okay. Um, there's another one. Um, you don't need to worry, Latria, about dominating the questions. That's fine. Uh, you know, insurance, it's interesting. I mean, I think if we got to a certain point, we potentially could try and go and procure, um, procure cover. Normally what we say at the moment is that the panellists are responsible for their own insurance. Um, and obviously in our terms and conditions, once something's handed over to a panel member, um, we don't take responsibility for what happens inside the case other than mm -hmm. the tech because that's, you know, that would be an intrusion into the role of the mediator or arbitrator. Mm -hmm. um, and that extends to the insurance. But 
we do require them to have it. And in Australia, there are uh, alternative dispute resolution policies that the um, that the legal insurers offer specifically to uh, people who are not even legally qualified, but who sit as mediators and arbitrators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, this is it, it's, it's a very interesting topic. And, and there was an organization, I think it was, I'm trying to remember their name, Consolidated Legal Concepts or something that provided mediator insurance in the United States for a long time. But I think they're starting to move out of that market. So a lot of us are saying, hmm, how are we going to fill that gap? Is this an important thing for us to have? I did have an experienced mediator say to me one time, look, if, if your party sue you as a mediator, oh, complete equity markets, that's right, Jim remembers. Um, and they would exhibit at all of our conferences. Um, uh, I think it was Jim who told me, you know, if, you, if your parties are suing you in a mediation, you're not doing mediation right, because, you know, obviously the mediator doesn't have any decision making authority. But I think that this is an important thing for us to think about, especially with online practice. I mean, you're talking about building an international panel. And if I'm a mediator in the US, and somebody invites me to resolve a case in Australia, well, that's kind of uncharted territory. I don't know what the what the rules are around mediator liability in that other geography. And I don't know how if I would be held liable or what that could mean for my practice. So that maybe this is something, again, we need to think about as a field. If people are going to be practicing across borders, we need to figure out how to ensure that they're protected should something go sideways. And thank you, Jim, for sharing that that link uh, with uh, with Mediate. I guess that they, there always has been practice across borders. It's just that everybody got on a plane and flew there. Um, That's right. It's it's an interesting point, though, because obviously people are insured in their own domestic market for their own domestic work. But we don't really hear in Australia, maybe this is just the states being more litigious. We It's very unheard of of a mediator or arbitrator to be sued as opposed to trying to set aside the award. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't think I've ever heard of a mediator or arbitrator being actually sued for negligence. Personally um, sued, yeah. Personally sued. I mean, maybe it happens more there than here. No, I, I don't think I've heard. I, I don't know if anyone on the call wants to speak up if they've heard of a case of that, but I, I haven't heard It's extremely heard of that. rare. Yeah, mm. extremely. Anil, did you want to say something? Yes. Uh, hi, Laura. Hi, Anil. Yeah, Good to see you again. We spoke last year, we spoke we last year at the AIAC uh, conference. Did. Yeah. Uh, just one comment uh, and then a question, uh, two comments and a question. So the first comment was that, yes, uh, last year, I think you did the AIAC moot uh, competition. And it yes. was brilliant because it was the start of COVID and everybody is changing platforms and AIAC, the Asia International Arbitration Center had this moot competition they were quite successful with. And I think you guys came in and did the, the platform. We did. It was seamless, it was brilliant. Right? <laughs> and, you know, can you just imagine this? Well done, Anil. Laura, you owe Anil dinner. Yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's point number one. Point number two is that, you know, I, I uh, appreciate the fact that you to told us about your background and, and, and where you came from. And so therefore you have an insight into it. You know, there are platforms, exactly like Colin mentioned, there are platforms where people have no idea about what dispute resolution is. But, you know, strangely, there are platforms where they're run by, organized by lawyers and all of that, uh, that they still don't know. I mean, there's, there's a particular one that, that, that I spoke to them and then I asked them, I said, so is it a mediation platform or is it an arbitration platform? And the answer was yes. You know, because <laughs> both are different. One is right, consensual right. and the other is an adjudicated. So now the question is this. You know, you, you mentioned a lot about mediation. Are you looking at, at moving into, into the uh, arbitration, uh, neutral yep. evaluation, expert determination, and uh, those platforms as well? Yes. And so when, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But when, when I originally set out um, to do this, the, the plan was that we would have, um, in fact, I sort of already planned it out, mediation, arbitration, um, binding expert determination, and non-binding evaluation. Uh, we haven't yet built, we're in the middle of building the arbitration workflow. This is for our own panel work. Um, the other two just never got done because we ended up, you know, needing to build features for courts and so on. And um, so it's always just a question of the priorities of the product roadmap. But the, the platform is built for both mediation and arbitration. And that's why, for example, you know, things like the live stream, which are important yes. for open justice, can be used in arbitration. We're getting inquiries where there are thousands of people who want to watch a proceeding or hundreds of people who want to watch a proceeding. So we're saying rather than having them all come in, which could be problematic, we can provide this YouTube link, which no one would ever be able to search. Mm -hmm. 
um, and so that people can watch. And, you know, you, you do have to manage it though, because that means that it is slightly more public than what it would be as a private arbitration in a room. But it's it's trying to find where the line is um, uh, between it. But we certainly have all the capability and functionality to do to do any of those disciplines. When you when you stand back far enough and look at what features are required, um, and you know the protection of the parties, the the allocation of people into plaintiff and defendant teams, um, you know all of that. The the control that the neutral has versus the you know the lack of control of the participants is all sort of built in. So, it, it, you know what they what they're doing in their brain to deliver the outcome is, is sort of secondary at that level once we've provided the requisite functionality. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's it's almost hard to it's hard to come up with an exhaustive list of all the areas where your technology could be useful. I mean, there's so many different possible application areas, um, but I think that, ma that makes it a, a challenge. It, you now know you have this powerful platform. What's the right vertical to target next? You know, legal you know services or billion dollar that? arbitrations? Sorry. I can't tell you how many conversations we've had about this. Right. Um, and in particular, you know, the brains trust that I have, you know, sort of saying to me, you can't do both courts and lawyers. And I've explained to them till they're bored witless that the market is connected and you can't really tackle one without the other because right. you can't sort of do in court justice without looking at out of court justice because they're, it's a justice continuum. Right. Um, and so I've maintained my sort of commitment to trying to do, um, to trying to do both for the time being. Right. <laughs> but, you know, that, that what industry vertical thing is just a constant battle because you get drawn into, well, that's the next opportunity that you have in Absolutely. construction or employment or whatever. Um, I, I had that conversation with my investors at Modria constantly. They were like, focus, focus, focus private or public. I'm like, look, we need to do both. We need to do both. These are both valuable markets. They were like, no, no, focus, focus, focus. So I understand the, some of the pressure you're under. Look, I, I, I could talk with you all day, Laura. Uh, I, I think I, I just want to, again, compliment you for the great work you've done. You play a very, very important role in the global uh, ODR field because you have this very high profile as a commercial litigator and you know that world so well and you understand the quality of polish and professionalism required to get traction in that world. Um, so uh, please keep up the good work. Thank you so much for sharing for your platform me. with us. Can I? Can we please get a round of applause for Laura to thank her for joining Sweet. us today? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank you. This I'd was wonderful. To to the meetings and see you more often. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll try and do more in the afternoon California time, so we don't have you up at three a.m. So uh, thank you so much, Laura, um, and you. take care, everyone. Have a great Thank summer you. and we'll talk Bye. again soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Colin, do you want to just stay on for two seconds? Sure, absolutely. Let me stop the recording. Uh, let's click the magic button here. Hmm. There it is. Stop recording. <laughs>